Greetings, it's your host, Gabe Morales. In the past, I've mostly covered stories of prison or street gangs, or focused on notorious gangsters in America. I will return to more episodes in that genre in the future, but I didn't want my channel to get boxed in with that label. I also recently did some exposés of crooked cops and politicians, and I plan to do more of those also. But for the next few months, I will be covering some true crime stories. I will first produce some videos that I have some inside knowledge of and perhaps even had direct contact with the culprits. I will also talk to people who investigated major crimes and know specific cases very well. Now, I know many of these notorious crimes have been covered on other channels before, but I will try to give my own take, provide certain details, and there might even be some surprises for you, the viewer. As most of you know, I spent over 30 years in corrections often communicating with police detectives. And I dealt with some very dangerous individuals, as well as some very creepy ones. I am not a psychologist, but I may bring on some experts in the field who may discuss some of the human, or maybe better said, subhuman psychology of these individuals. Most of these subjects were males, although I may include a few females. Some of them looked and acted very strange, so would give instant cause for concern by most people. Others could be your neighbor, your co-worker, handsome, charming. And so it was in the case of Theodore Robert Bundy, who was an American serial killer who kidnapped, raped, and murdered dozens of young women during the 1970s. He was eventually viewed as a suspect by multiple detectives in multiple agencies for his gruesome crimes. And he was eventually arrested and convicted, even after more than a decade of denials. But eventually Bundy confessed to having committed up to 30 or more murders in seven states between 1974 and 1978. The true victim total is unknown even today. Bundy often employed charm and often used disguises when kidnapping his victims. And he often tried to manipulate law enforcement, the media, and tried to play the criminal justice system, often acting as his own attorney, maintaining his complete innocence. He typically approached women in public places, although sometimes he snuck into the rooms. He'd often play the victim role, using a cast or crutches and asked his target victims for assistance. In addition to acting injured using his puppy dog eyes, he would sometimes impersonate law enforcement or an authority figure. And once tricked into being led away, he would often bludgeon his victims and would take them elsewhere, often in his Volkswagen, where he would sexually assault them and eventually kill them. Bundy sometimes revisited the bodies of those he abducted, grooming them and performing sexual acts on their corpses until they decomposed or were eaten by animals, which made this impossible for him to achieve. At least 12 of his victims were decapitated, and often he would place their severe heads in his apartment. He also often took Polaroid photos of his victims as additional mementos. Now, I never personally met Bundy, although I did encounter one individual who did. This was a lady who dated Bundy in the early 1970s. She was one of the lucky ones. She lived to talk about it. This lady was a girlfriend of my dad's roommate when he lived in the Wallingford district. And my dad's house was located about a mile west from where Bundy lived and where he murdered some of his victims. It just so happened that this lady was blind and news was just coming out about Bundy and his multiple victims. I remember at the time, females everywhere in the greater Seattle area were scared that they might be next. I also recall during the 1970s that hitchhiking was very popular. But after Ted Bundy's victims started popping up all over the radar, hitchhiking by young women in particular dropped sharply. My brother and I were teenagers, and being bold like many kids at that age, we asked her why wasn't she killed, and she told us she had a theory on that. Well, you see, Bundy liked to cut the heads off of his victims, and then have sex with them, and have the heads watch him desecrate their bodies while he did this. But I'm blind, she stated the obvious. He must have reasoned that I would not be able to see him do this in the afterlife. So I guess that's why he left me alone. Now, my brother and I were both shocked and amazed at this eerie assessment of the serial killer. As I stated, my dad lived in the Wallingford district, and my brother lived with him while I lived with my mother in West Seattle. My mother at the time attended the University of Washington at the same time some of Bundy's murders occurred. In fact, she worked at a Xerox place located next to the famous and historic College Inn pub where she would hang out after work with a lot of her friends. This College Inn pub is located just blocks from where Ted lived. 
and where many of his victims were killed. I still shudder at the thought that she easily could have been one of his victims, as he was a criminal of opportunity. I also communicated several times with Anne Rule, who wrote a book about Ted Bundy called The Stranger Beside Me. She called her book this because she worked with Ted Bundy when they both volunteered for a suicide hotline in 1971. Anne Rule considered him to be a friend and even put money on his books and often defended him, saying he was a really nice guy and could not believe that he was guilty of these murders. But once he admitted that he indeed had committed these crimes, and once she came to terms with this, she described him as a sadistic sociopath who took pleasure from another person's pain and the control he had over his victims to the point of death and even after. Bundy once described himself as being the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. It seems to me that he had a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of personality. Bundy was born on November 24th, 1946, to Eleanor Louise Cowell in Burlington, Vermont. His biological father's identity has never been confirmed. And for the first three years of his life, Ted Bundy lived with his maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell, and just assumed that they were his real parents. According to Ann Rule, who knew Bundy and interviewed him at length, he did not find out until 1969 that his grandparents weren't his parents. He thought his mom was his older sister, and he held a lifetime resentment against his mother for not coming clean with this information and never talking to him about his real father. In 1950, his mother, Louise, changed her name from Cal to Nelson, and left to live with some cousins in the Tacoma, Washington area. In 1951, she met Johnny Culpepper Bundy, who was a hospital cook, and they soon married, and he gave Ted his last name of Bundy. But Ted Bundy states that he always felt very distant from his stepfather. After graduating from the University of Washington in 1972, Bundy joined Governor Dan Evans' re-election campaign and worked very hard for him, even going as far as spying on Evans' political opponent. When news of this came to light, Bundy expressed dismay at the media making such a big deal out of it. He stated this while smiling on camera, and it is obvious to me that he enjoyed the media attention and was likely thrilled at the, the mass press coverage of him in later years. Governor Evans was so impressed with Bundy that he appointed him to the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee, where Bundy wrote a pamphlet on rape prevention, of all creepy things. There is no clear consensus on when Bundy started killing, as he told different people different stories. He was basically a habitual liar. But some people believe that he started killing women after he was infatuated with a young lady named Diane Edwards, and he expressed keen interest in her. But her father shooed him off and dismissed him, and this act demeaned Bundy. Again, nobody really knows how many victims Bundy killed, but many of his victims did resemble each other, and they resembled Diane Edwards. Bundy hinted to homicide detective Robert Keppel that he committed a murder in 1972 in Seattle and another murder in 1973 in Tumwater, Washington, which is located just south of Olympia, Washington the capital of Washington State, where Governor Dan Evans sat. But both Ann Rule and Detective Keppel believe that Bundy may have started killing even as early as a teenager. However, his earliest documented homicides occurred in 1974, when he was 27 years old. By his own admission, Bundy very quickly mastered his skills in killing, leaving minimal incriminating evidence at the scenes. Now you have to understand, this is before DNA was used to help convict many criminals as is done today. Shortly after midnight on January 4th, 1974, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, Mary Adams, and Terry Caldwell. After bludgeoning Sparks with a metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious at the hospital for 10 days, and although she survived the attack, she was left with permanent disabilities. About a month later, in the early morning hours of February 1st, 1974, Bundy broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Haley, a University of Washington undergraduate who broadcast a morning radio weather broadcast for skiers. She and a couple of her friends had earlier been at Dante's Tavern, located off of 53rd and Roosevelt Way in the University District. Ted was a regular customer there, and it is believed that he followed her home. Only her skull was found on Taylor Mountain a year later. That mountain was referred to as being Bundy's graveyard, as he left multiple remains there. 
After his first two attacks, Bundy decided to take his killing spree on the road, where he also killed victims in the state of Oregon. During the first half of 1974, female college students were disappearing at the rate of about one a month and Bundy was believed to be the culprit in many of these cases. And investigators from Seattle Police and King County Sheriff's Office became increasingly concerned. On June 1, 1974, Brenda Carroll Ball, age 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burien, Washington. I know this corner of 128th and Ambon very well, and have passed by it hundreds of times. As my compadre lived very close by, and my brother lived at some apartments, located only a couple blocks north of it, and he would often hang out there when and went by Mario's. Anyways, Brenda Ball was last seen in the parking lot of the Flame Tavern, talking to a brown-haired man who had his arm in a sling. That individual was later found to be Ted Bundy. Ten days later, in the early hours of June 11th, UW student Georgianne Hawkins vanished while walking between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. Bundy later told Detective Keppel that he lured Hawkins to his car and knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. After handcuffing her, he drove to Issaquah, Washington, which is located just east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the night with her body. He later returned to the crime scene and scoped it out, gathering one of Hawkins' earrings and a shoe that she left behind. Detective Keppel noted that it was so brazen that it astonishes police even today. Bundy said he revisited the corpse of Hawkins at least three times or engaged in sexual acts. After Hawkins disappeared and there was a lot of press, Witnesses started coming forward. One witness described seeing a man on the date and near the time of her disappearance as being on crutches with a leg cast and was struggling to carry a briefcase. Another woman recalled that a man asked her with a similar description to help carry his briefcase to his car, which was a light brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. Pressure mounted on local law enforcement agencies to catch the killer, but Like I said, Bundy was pretty good at cleaning up any physical evidence or barely leaving a trace of his crimes, which gave the police little to go on. Up until that point, almost all of the incidents happened at night, and all of the victims were wearing either slacks or blue jeans when abducted. But the night murder method of operation by Bundy was about to change. We have Mr. John Liebert on as a guest. He is a practicing psychiatrist in Arizona presently. He has published many books on criminology, in particular on Ted Bundy. I learned a lot from Bob Keppel, who learned something from me, I guess. We worked together. And Bob Keppel basically specialized in a serial killing and estimated that there only are about a couple thousand active serial lust killers operating in the United States. That's rare, 2,000 out of 300 million compared to sexual assault. But when you look at how these guys move around on the interstate highways and their mobility, and their ability to blend in because of their personality. That's all they're thinking about. That's all they're thinking about is their next victim. So they've got the upper hand. If you do the math, Bundy, I just saw a Justice Department report in my file. I picked it out. I almost fell over. I think that he confessed to 30 in the Northwest And then, of course, he was convicted in Florida for five out of the confessions. I think there were like 25. These numbers are not totally accurate, but there were 25 cases cleared where he confessed, said, "Okay, I killed her. She's at the crossroads of Highway C and 21 in Oregon. That's where I killed her and dumped her. Well, they didn't find them all. They were missing. He killed them but they couldn't find the dump sites, or at least they couldn't find any remains. So they only cleared a very small percentage of the people that he killed, um, probably a quarter. I know that Keppel would agree with me on this, that he's probably good for a hundred. John, can you help us understand? I think a lot of people like true crime so much because hard for most of us to understand the mentality of some of these mass murders and just, you know, arch criminals. Can you help us understand a little bit more about the thought process of psychopaths, mass murders like Ted Bundy? 
Well, first of all, a psychopath is a fairly broad term and just means that a person doesn't have a conscience and has a motivation for something. I like to think of it as a snake. You know, they're cold-blooded. You can step on their tail and they may nail you, but they may get away, but they don't remember you and they're on to their next spray because they're they're constantly just crawling around cold-blooded they're looking for their prey. That's 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 their job. That's their motive, full motivation. If somebody wants to go deep into this, you can Google the International Journal of Criminology and Offender Therapy. And it's I published an article on the motivation of serial killing. So if you want to go into the depth of that, my theory of why these people do this. And it's called Contributions of Psychiatry to the Study of, of Serial Lust Murder is the name of the article in the International Journal of Offender Therapy. This concludes part one of our true crime profile on Ted Bundy. Part two will follow soon. Until then, please stay safe.